Jane Paris. I work for the Division of Arts and Humanities to amplify the arts and humanities where all are welcome. Um, I'm Nicole Hadassah Valdez. I'm rhetoric and ISF double. Um, for rhetoric, my concentration is public discourse. For ISF, I do business economics and information, and I am an econ researcher at the Fisher Center of, Ur Fisher Center of Urban Economics and Real Estate. Double majoring is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world, and the humanities means you're reading a lot, and you're spending a lot of time close reading your text. I'm Bear Goodson. Um, I'm a junior transfer from Berkeley City College, so just right over here. I'm in the Scandinavian department, one of the smallest departments on campus, uh, so it's been a really interesting experience. All my friends have classes with a lot of people in them sometimes, uh, but this last semester I got the chance to take a graduate course in my department. Um, the professor had only took a class, and it was just me, two graduate students, and my professor. And every Thursday we met for three hours and we just went in depth into our subject. And it was just a really incredible experience. So don't overlook those tiny departments. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Alex. Um, I'm in the art history or history of art department. You can say it both ways. Um, I transferred here from Santa Rosa Junior College. Hi, my name is uh, Louis. I am a philosophy major here at Berkeley. Yeah, I'm also a, a student staff peer advisor for the reentry center. I'm a reentry transfer student. Transformative to me was actually getting participating in the reentry student program, taking a 198 adult learners in higher education. That was a very good resource. My greatest experience as a transfer student would be that I got the chance to study abroad in Paris last semester. And I just think that study abroad is something that can be overlooked by transfer students a little bit because you're thinking like, I only have four semesters here, I have to get everything done, I don't have time for that, but like it really can be done and it's very much worth it. I study art history, but I didn't really grow up in like a place that allowed for a lot of exploration in art. I was in community college and I took a class to fulfill like my art requirement, decided I really liked it, took all the rest of the classes and kind of realized like, okay, this is something that like I can continue with, I can do, I can study. And I love it because I think art is just kind of, it's the visual exploration of like human culture and emotion and history. You have to take like a theory course, which is a lot of philosophy. Um, you're really encouraged to take a language. And so it, it's its own discipline, but it really brings in aspects of a lot of different studies, which I think is really important. Um, so in terms of why I study it, I do just really love it. Rhetoric, a lot of people don't know what it is, first of all, um, but I will begin by saying I absolutely love this major. The department itself is incredible. Our faculty are all talented. Um, we have representatives of the Southeast Asian Department, the chair, Professor Chea. We have the chair of the humanities, global humanities, Professor Ramona Nadal. Um, in classics, we have Professor James Porter, who just got a Guggenheim Award. And what's cool about all of these incredible, amazing people is that they're accessible to you. Because so you can hang out with them and pick their brains. And every time I go to office hours, my Amazon list comes out pretty long because I have like 12 books in my cart and read them before my assigned readings. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, we definitely don't get into Scandinavian studies on accident. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I've always been very uh, passionate about like learning history. Um, I've queued into the medieval period pretty quickly and just found it really fascinating. While I was still at BCC, then I could cross enroll um, and take a class, one class per semester here at Cal. Um, but for BCC price. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, what can I take? Uh, and then I found out that they have an Old Norse class. And I was like, wait, I can like learn the language that the Vikings spoke? <laughs> they do that? You, just, you can take Sanskrit? What? Um, they have cuneiform classes. And I just found that it was this tiny little department. We've got like five professors. Um, you know, all, all your professors really well, they know you. 
I would be far better off studying something that really intrigued me and really made me passionate than studying something that was maybe going to, uh, you know, be more typical, more uh, uh, standard for getting a career later, but I would just not enjoy my time as much here, really optimizing how well I can study also, if you enjoy it. You can study a lot harder on it. <laughs> my goal is to get into law. I would like to take the LSAT. Um, a lot of people will, the route that they take to that goal is usually in uh, legal studies, political science, history, English, and philosophy. But I knew nothing about philosophy, so I figured if I'm gonna go to Berkeley, I'm gonna learn something I know nothing about. And it turns out I didn't figure this out until I got here. Berkeley is actually really famous for philosophy. <laughs> I'm glad I chose philosophy. It was tough. It's a tough. It's a tough major because it's so famous and we're known for it. It's rigorous. You have something to aspire to. They have expectations. It's instilled in me some discipline. I've come away with a set of skills that are been, uh, really beneficial for dissecting arguments, reconstructing arguments learning how to categorize things, look at things in the abstract. It's up to the student to figure out the path. The students are all on this journey of what do I want to do and how am I going to acquire those skills? What you can do with it is anything you want that is really true. So for if you're worried about like, oh, I'm not going to get a job where I make much money, that's really your decision. What job do you want to seek and, and get the skills to do that, which you'll get both in the classroom and outside the classroom. And if you're looking for something that will teach you abilities and skills and things that you can market out there, Philosophy is good for that. It doesn't confine you to one field. It really does open a lot of things up for you, I believe. There's a lot of like opportunity for travel in art history and working abroad, and I was really interested in that. There's actually like a wide, you know, very like deep pool of like jobs that you can you can really choose from. Which sort of those questions everyone always asks, like art history, like what are you gonna do with that? And there, there are options. There are a lot of things you can do with it. I will be joining Deloitte's um, financial advisory in risk intelligence in the fall. That he's been chosen to give the commencement address at his department's graduation. So just tell us a little bit about how that happened and if you have any ideas of what you might say. <laughs> how that happened? I'm, I might ask you that. <laughs> I know I'm not the, the top student in my class, but what I can say is this about my overall experience and one of the things I will bring up at my commencement is I, I, I've come to realize these last couple of weeks that I will never ever, this likely never ever again, be able to be in the company of so many brilliant people talking about something that's got my interest like this again. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean my professors. They kind of facilitate it. And the GSIs, they kind of like throw some adrenaline in it. But the thing that makes that happen is my classmates. And uh, those are some brilliant people. And it's, it's interesting because I I, at times I don't know if they realize that. <laughs> but they are. Yeah, I do think that people here don't realize how smart they are because they think, oh, everyone else is so smart here. Like, right, you're all smart. <laughs> Never thought twice about not doing double because you're at Berkeley and as a transfer, you've already been working hard, so why not just go a little further and work a little harder? The rhetoric, a lot of people question its value and I could not have seen a, an undergraduate career without it. It's really where my heart does lie. And ISF is fun and flexible. And I take classes at the Master's School of Information for it as well. But there is no intellectual community because it's so individualized. I am very interested in the public and public works. And I would eventually like to be in public investment. And for that, a humanities 
understanding and training what's not only necessary, but it kind of serves as like a bionic arm for whatever technical skills I'm learning elsewhere. When you're like registering with the department and everything, they ask you to write down like your interests because you're expected to declare a focus, but it's not like very rigid. You don't need to have it like declared necessarily like when you come in. They give you time as a transfer student to kind of take different classes and explore what you're interested in. And for me, it just so happened that what I'm really interested in, like we have a professor on campus and um, we have like the same the same interest. He's you know written books on exactly what I'm writing my thesis on. So um, for me, it just kind of made sense. But it, it did help to kind of have someone there who already embodied like what I'm interested in, and I was able to like work closely with him, and and I'm still working closely with him. You know, they they expect you to like <laughs> narrow yourself, but you don't like have to know exactly like pinpoint what you want to do in the field of art history when you come in. Like they give you time to kind of explore things. In terms of museums, in Berkeley itself, we've got the Berkeley Art Museum, the University Museum. I work there. Like contemporary art and like photography there than what I'm studying. So for me, it's like more worth it to go to some of the museums in San Francisco. Like the Legion of Honor has a really great collection of like early modern European works. I have the Hearst Anthropology Museum on campus, and um, a lot of like objects that you study in art history aren't just paintings. Like you do study a lot of like objects too. The Hearst collection is like massive. And as an undergraduate, um, you do have access to like their full collection. So if there's like a specific thing that you're interested in, they can like bring it out of storage for you to study it, which is really, really amazing. To clarify, the lower division classes um, at UC Berkeley are numbered one through 99, and then the upper division are um, 100 to 199 and are more of your junior and senior year. Um, for me, one of the biggest differences between like classes here and classes at community college are that in community college, they're mostly like survey classes. It'll be like a world art like two fifteen hundred or something like that, and it's very basic. It's all like memorization. The papers you're just gonna write are just like formal analysis papers explaining something. When you're in an upper division course, there's an expectation that you have the method down. So you're kind of, a, there's a course called a Methods Philosophy 100, and it's kind of like a boot camp for, for philosophers. But you learn how to write philosophy in community college, it's going to be very different from writing philosophy when you come to Berkeley. And Methods is the, is the tool, it's, that's, the, that's where you get put through the grinder. And you're expected to kind of have come through that by the time you take the upper division courses. So there's some sophistication that is expected of you in your writing. You're gonna to have to be able to display levels of comprehension that you didn't really have to, you may have just been able to have to uh, reconstruct an argument in the lower division and hint at what the, hint at what the possibilities, how that would extrapolate out, what comes from that. Here you're gonna to have to provide objections to it. You know, they have to be well worded, well, well worked out objections, well thought out objections. You have to, transfer what's going on in your head through to your hand onto a piece of paper such that the person reading it can understand it clearly. And um, that I think is the main difference. There seems to me that there's more papers writing in the lower division, but they're more lenient on how they grade it because a lot of people in those classes are not necessarily philosophy majors. Those are the larger classes. When you get to the upper division classes, it's more rigorous. But, but the challenge, but the challenge is actually more rewarding once you get done with it, because you walk away. I, I couldn't talk like this if it wasn't for the freaking <laughs> upper division classes. <laughs> I mean, I just woke up one day and I was like, "Who is that talking?" <laughs> So I noticed that it does have that effect. Um, I can't tell you when it happened, it just, it does happen. I would like to speak towards that language changing. Your language does elevate because it's being curated, it's being shaped. Um, your friends that are not in your field of study are going to be like, 
you sound really pretentious, what are you on? <laughs> the people that are in your study are going to sh push you forward into this higher realm of language where you do stop recognizing yourself to some degree. And you're like, okay, this is no longer the language of real life. I am officially in academia. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, and that can be problematic if you're trying to hold on to communities that you've developed before school. Don't feel bad about it. Everyone goes through it. And like I kind of struggled with the whole language thing a little bit. Like. Neither of my parents went to college. My mom grew up in Texas. I grew up saying wash instead of wash. <laughs> and I still get the sense that sometimes in my seminars, I tend to talk a little more casually than some of my peers. And I do get a little bit like self-conscious about that sometimes. But um, it, is, it is a switch that I think a lot of people don't really expect coming. And like, it's not something you think about, but it definitely exists. I remember when Alexander earlier was like, those of us in arts and humanities don't generally care uh, or we're not super concerned with the amount of money. I would like to start there because if you're in it for the money or a job, I would definitely switch your mindset and really discover what you love doing is. Um, your professional prospects will vary depending on your project and which disciplines you draw on. Mine are good. I'm not going to say because of the disciplines that I have. I'm going to say that because I worked as um, a community college student, those, influ those jobs and internships influenced what I wanted to study and how I wanted to study them. And that led me to my project and my thesis proposal, which I care about a lot. And it's as far as professional prospects, um, I'm going into big four for finance. Um, I'm not going to say this is my dream job because it isn't. I want to go into public works. I want to be at either the city of Oakland or the port of Oakland and really work in policy in the long run. Please, please, I encourage you to study something that you love. It is very difficult to excel in any discipline here. It's, it's not easy. And you need that little extra to keep you going at two, three in the morning when your eyes twitching and you have had four cups of coffee. It don't look good. <laughs> There's a pathway to do that to get into to get into research. It's the URAP Undergraduate Research Apprentice Program. All right, and it's it's not restricted by to uh, to what major you're in. All students are, it's available to all students, as I understand it. I did do an independent study where I did a focus on uh, Baruch de Spinoza because we didn't offer that class, but we do have somebody whose expertise is Spinoza, so that was convenient. The research and the way to get involved in research, so across campus we have a program called URAP, Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program. Everyone can apply, uh, professors from all different disciplines, put out like, here's what I'm looking for. Students apply, the information is usually like in August and you have to apply by the first week of the semester to be someone's research apprentice. You can also just contact professors that I know you guys are looking on websites and reading about the professors. You can contact them on your own and say, do you need someone to help you with this research? Uh, you can do an independent study, which is what Louis meant, which is just saying, I want to study Spinoza and um, find a professor who's willing to supervise it, and there you did some research. The, the bar I had to meet was the competitiveness with myself, in this sense. <laughs> like I said earlier, my classmates are like really intelligent people. And the the desire to not sound like a complete moron <laughs> when I'm talking to them is what drove me to. That was the comp that was where that was where the comp competition came from. You know what I mean? It was like challenging myself in that sense. I had to know what I was talking about because if I didn't know what I was talking about, everybody in that room would be able to see it. I don't really find that the competitiveness to be something that's a hindrance. In fact, I find it's a way that we grow. So there was competition to participate. There's competition to make your voice heard. And the way that I feel in the classes that I've taken is I just feel like all of the professors like really just want to see you like grow and succeed. And especially in art history, um, it's just a lot of critical thinking. And so it's not necessarily saying like, 
this is right, this is wrong. It's just like an exploration of your thoughts and like connecting things. And so I really don't like get a sense of that competitive aspect that other people do. I always prevail for UCLA. <laughs> So advisors in every major department, um, in every department, there is an advisor. There are also advisors at the college level. And that whole profession is about supporting students. So we are here to help you. We're not like about to just tell you rules and policy. So please do remember your advisors when you're a student here and that that's an excellent resource. Okay. And then just a little bit about what you said too. So I actually have three advisors. So we have a department advisor, and then we have an academic advisor who's different, and then I have like a personal advisor for my thesis. And so that's just like a really, really solid support system. I feel like the people here, like the arts and humanities, I feel like is like a community that just wants everyone to like do well and succeed and grow academically and also grow as a person. And definitely like going to see your advisors, like making friends in the department, that's, that's a really big part of that. I never ever got the sense, or I haven't yet to believe, that anybody in the faculty or staff is interested in not seeing me succeed. I've always felt that they want me to succeed. And that's really, really important. I think the biggest thing for uh, mental health, other than the support on campus, like at the Tang Center, um, peer counseling, things like that, um, is finding a community. Finding that could be just your roommates, that can be anyone around you, your classmates, don't be afraid in your classes. Like first class, get somebody's number, say, hey, do you like would you ever want to do a study session? Like make a group around yourself, get those supports and and those people will really be your anchors uh, for your time here. And as far as mental health goes, really your support system. Please try to develop those and have healthy ways of coping. There are lots of hiking trails where you need fresh air, um, get your blood going. I'm going to make a quick little plug for the Berkeley Art Studio. Uh -huh. um, that's a really good way of like, you know, processing things, dealing with mental health issues. For me, like I love making pottery. Um, I just feel like that's a very therapeutic thing. Um, just for me, I think like doing things with your hands that can kind of give your brain a little bit of a break. I think there's a lot of value in that. Your fellow students are going to be your greatest resource. The people who, who are struggling with you in those classrooms are going to be your greatest resource. In philosophy, we have a group called Minorities on Philosophy. We try to address issues that come up, issues of equity, um, mental health, those kind of things that are that people may have to deal with while they're going through the course of the semester. Also, as transfer students, you have resources through the Transfer Center. I would encourage you to take advantage of. If you're a re-entry student, I'm also a peer advisor for the re-entry student program. Take advantage of those resources. They have, they have groups and stuff you can participate in. But sometimes it's just about letting off some steam. You know what I mean? Open the valve, let that stuff go. Um, exercising RSF, excellent resource for mental health. Take 13 units to be considered full-time. That means a lot of times you're looking for one unit or maybe two. If you're saying yoga, there's dancing, there's dance classes, stuff like that, that'll help you pick up that unit and keep you sane. Um, all those things are resources. And you know what, you have counseling too. You get like four counseling sessions for free. There's no shame in taking advantage of it. You know what I mean? It's in, it's in your tuition, it's really not free. <laughs> so, you're not gaming the system, right? <laughs> it's free in virtue of you paying for it. Really, these students are obviously arts and humanities majors, but probably some of you out there aren't arts and humanities majors, but I hope you know that obviously you can take our classes. And now I'd really just like to show these students how awesome they are and how much we appreciate them.